Good afternoon. Uh, before I uh, introduce our speakers and begin our program, let me just make an announcement uh, about the course. Uh, Dr. Seeley isn't here, and so he wanted me to remind you of the assignment on Blackboard to uh, be involved in the group discussion. It's been posted here this past couple of weeks, and uh, there's a question for you to respond to. You've been divided up into groups, and we'd like you to post at least two well thought out responses to these questions. And that'll be open until tomorrow night, Friday night at, uh, I think he's got it closed off at 11.59. So uh, if you would uh, be sure and get that assignment done. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Reed and Christine Halliday Executive Lecture Series. We're very pleased to uh, introduce to you and welcome Mr. Bill Child. Uh, currently serves as the chairman of the board of R.C. Willey uh, Home Furnishings and retired as the president of R.C. Willey uh, in 2003. Uh, he took the company from $250,000 uh, to, to $257 million before selling it in 1995 to Warren Buffett, uh, Berkshire Hathaway and uh, is now one of uh, Mr. Buffett's favorite investments and favorite companies. And this is the story that we're going to hear today, how that all came about. We'd also like to welcome Mr. Jeff Benedict, uh, who is the author of the book, How to Build a Business Warren Buffett Would Buy. Uh, Mr. Benedict is considered uh, one of America's top investigative journalists. He has published several critically acclaimed books, including Little Pink House and Without Reservation, and has, and has articles uh, published in Sports Illustrated, the New York Times, and the Los Angeles Times. He has appeared on ESPN, NBC Nightly News, CBS's 60 Minutes, and ABC News, and it currently teaches creative writing at Southern Virginia University. We are very excited and pleased to have uh, both these gentlemen here today, particularly Mr. Child, and I might mention that he uh, received the Woodbury School of Business First Excellence in Leadership Award several years ago, and so uh, pleased to have him back today. Please welcome Mr. Bill Child and Mr. Jeff Benedict. All right, good, good morning, everyone. It's a, it's a real privilege to be here. Uh, it's my first time on this campus, and uh, I'm just going to spend a few minutes actually talking about some things a little bit different than what Bill will talk about. Uh, I'm not a, a businessman, per se, uh, and don't profess to know an awful lot about it, but I've had the privilege of writing a couple of books about some very successful businessmen, Bill being the most recent. Uh, and I thought what I'd do in my few minutes is just uh, give you a little bit of a flavor of, of what I do and how Bill and I got acquainted and um, how this book came about. Uh, I went to uh, law school with the intention of being a lawyer, and uh, in particular a prosecutor. It was a goal of mine for a long time, and probably like many of you, I had carefully planned out my academic track and my, um, my summer jobs to align myself uh, to be able to become a prosecutor. And I went through uh, undergraduate, and I went through graduate school. Uh, I interned in the district attorney's office in Boston, did all the right things. And in my first year of law school, um, I received an unexpected surprise, which was an offer from a commercial publishing house in New York to write a book with a writer from Sports Illustrated. Uh, I jumped at the opportunity, and with no thought that this would actually lead to a career change, I just thought it was a wonderful opportunity. I, I would do this one book, and then I would keep going with the law education and proceed with my plans. Um, what happened, though, was when I got into this project, the book was about the, the National Football League and the criminals who play in it. And um, we titled the book Pros and Cons. And um, <laughs> it's actually not a funny book, but uh, <clears throat> it's a pretty serious book. And uh, it, was, it was pretty intense working on it. And, uh, but one of the things I learned in working on the project was that the writer from Sports Illustrated doesn't actually write. Um, I, I, had to do all the work. I was this no-name guy on low on the totem pole with really no reputation to speak of, but I had done a lot of research and a lot of work on athletes and crime because I worked on that in my master's degree thesis. So, and I'd had some stuff published in the New York Times while I was in grad school, and 
And that's why I got this offer to team up with, a, with an experienced writer from SI um, who was an investigative reporter. And so I worked on this book with him, and one of my tasks was to look at the criminal backgrounds of 1,560 players in the NFL and find out how many of them were, had felony records and then sort of cherry pick the, the most egregious offenses and those were the ones we wrote up in the book. Uh, at the end of the process we turned the book in and my editor, I went to New York and I remember the feeling of being in the Time Life building which was a building that was kind of iconic to me growing up in the Northeast. I certainly knew the building very well uh, but I'd never had the privilege of being inside it but I knew that's where Sports Illustrated and Time and People and all these magazines that I grew up with were published. And my publisher was in the same building because uh, Time Life owned us too. And uh, when he walked me out to the car that day to put me in the taxi to go home, after, me, after I had submitted the manuscript finished, he uh, put his hand on my shoulder and he tapped me and he said, um, kid, you could write for us any time. And I remember I got in the taxi and I started towards the train station and I was thinking to myself, is that for real? I mean, was he just you know, being a nice guy and trying to give me a compliment or did he really mean that? And it turned out he really did mean it. And uh, so at the end of my first year of law school, I had a huge decision to make, which was, you know, should I pursue this totally different career track, which is so far away from what I've been gearing up for all through grad school and, and the beginning of law school, um, or should I ignore that and keep going with what my plan was? And I decided to jump uh, off the track I was on, which was moving pretty fast, and I moved on to a track that was moving even faster. I stayed in law school and completed my law degree, but um, I officially became a writer at the end of my first year, meaning I signed a new contract and it became my profession. And I wrote two more books before I graduated from law school. So by the time I got my law degree, um, I had three uh, commercially uh, completed books and I knew I wasn't gonna practice law. Uh, I tell you that story because what's happened as a result is um, I've had a, a career now that's um, been remarkable and rewarding in so many respects. And I've got to meet guys like Bill that you know I, I would have never known. And frankly, growing up in in the Northeast, I'd never heard of R.C. Willie. Um, I, I didn't know what it was. It sounded like a cool name, but I thought, you know, I don't really know what that is. And I met Bill because of this writing track that I got on. And that same editor that put me in the car when I was a first-year law student called me about 10 years later. And we, we obviously continue to work together. But one day, about 10 years later, he called me at home, which he never does, on a holiday weekend, Thanksgiving. And he, he asked me to do something which was rather shocking. Um, he asked me if I would be willing to write a book about eight Mormon CEOs, most of whom were based in New York City where we live, and uh, were running companies like American Express and JetBlue and Madison Square Garden and stuff like that. And, and uh, it was a remarkable request, because usually I have to beg my editor to accept my ideas and to pay me to go out and write about them. And more times than not, I get turned down. Um, you know, I have to come up with something that really knocks him over. And here he was coming to me saying, would you be willing to do this? And uh, he gave me a purchase price and he also said, we'd like you to title the book The Mormon Way of Doing Business. I was stunned and I said, you know, why, uh, why are you asking me to do this? And he said, well, because you're the only Mormon we know. <laughs> and I said, well, um, okay, um, I'd like to do that because I think it would be a unique experience. And basically I got in the pocket of these CEOs for a year and I followed them around. And uh, the reason they asked me to do that, not only because I happen to be Mormon too, but because uh, we'd got, they'd gotten to know a little bit about my, my ethics and my values and the things that I did as a writer, that they thought, you know, maybe these guys who are very private might open up to you, and they did. And that's how I met Bill. Because one day um, after that book came out and I was on to my next book, uh, one day I got a call from a guy who knows Bill and knows me. Bill and I don't know each other at all. But this guy called up and he said, you know, I met with uh, this gentleman named Bill Child today and I found out that he's interested in writing a book. And I said, well, what's the, who is he and what's the book? And he said, well, Bill Child founded this great furniture store chain in Utah that's now expanded into other western states. It's called R.C. Willie. 
And I thought, oh, that's kind of an interesting name for a furniture store. And he said, well, um, Bill's done very well, and he'd like to write a book about his company. It was recently bought by Warren Buffett. And he said he's even got a title picked out. The book, he wants the book to be called How to Build a Business Warren Buffett Would Buy. And I thought, wow, that's, that's a pretty catchy title. It's kind of like pros and cons. The, the criminals are playing the NFL. It gets your attention. It's just nicer. Um, and uh, so I, I uh, wrote Bill a letter. I'm a complete stranger to Bill. But the, the one thing Bill knew about me was he knew I had written this other book called The Mormon Way of Doing Business. And that's the reason he was interested in talking to me. I sent Bill a letter and said, I heard you want to write a book. I'd be interested in hearing more about your idea. Bill called me. And I asked him what he wanted to do. And he, he had it fairly well mapped out. It was obvious he'd given it a lot of thought. And I think Bill will tell you why he'd been thinking about it. I won't tell you that. He can. But what I was interested in is because uh, I told you I don't know a lot about business. There's one business I know a lot about. It's the one I'm in. And that's the publishing business which most people don't understand. It's a strange business. Nine out of every 10 books that are published lose money. It's kind of like the movie industry. And you wonder, well, how, how do they survive? Well, because one out of every 10 books is a home run, and it makes enough money to overcome the nine that lose. And that's the business I'm in. It's kind of it's upside down. But um, one of the tricks is selling ideas to your publisher. And so I asked Bill, what's the story here? And Bill told me that in 1954, he graduated from college here in Utah, and the day he graduated, he went to see his in-laws, and his father-in-law handed him the keys to the store, the R.C. Willie store in Syracuse, Utah, just a tiny 600-square-foot cinder block store in a cornfield in Syracuse. And he asked Bill if he'd just watch the store uh, for two weeks while Bill was going to go on vacation, I mean, while his father-in-law was going to go on vacation, because he thought he had an ulcer. He'd been working a lot relentlessly, and he, he thought he had an ulcer. And Bill said, sure, because Bill's a good guy. And he took the keys, and his father-in-law went off to California. Well, three days later, he was back. Obviously, he never made it to California. He was so sick, they came back and put him right in the hospital. And shortly after he was admitted to the hospital, they discovered that he had cancer, and he never came out of the hospital. He died there. And here was Bill holding the keys to the store. And this is a little bit why I told you my little story about law school and writing is because Bill was all positioned to become a teacher. That's what he was educated in. He had his degree. He had a certificate. He had a job offer from a public school in northern Utah. Everything was lined up. All he had to do was sign the contract and start teaching in the fall. Suddenly he's holding the keys to the store and those keys symbolize a lot more now than just a store. He's got to think about a lot of things like his mother-in-law who, how is she going to survive without the income from the business that her husband used to run. Um, there were a lot of things to consider, and Bill decided to stick with the business. And it's a decision that absolutely changed in a dramatic fashion the course of his life. It put him on a path that he never anticipated, he never dreamed about, and it had him doing something that was completely outside his comfort zone. But what he quickly discovered was he was really good at it. Really, really good at it. Better than anybody else in Utah was at it. And there were just things that you would have never known if this opportunity hadn't presented itself. In some ways, you might say, uh, well, it wasn't so much an opportunity. It was sort of a tragedy. You might say that. But it was an opportunity that he seized for all the right reasons. He took over the store. He realized they were in debt. The IRS was auditing them. The bank was calling in their loans. It's all the things you don't want to hear when you're taking over a business. But Bill plowed his way through all that stuff, doing some things that I found, as an uneducated business student, I found rather profound. And yet, at the same time, simple and common sense, the kind of things that are easy to poo-poo and put aside as not sophisticated. But nobody can poo-poo the end of the story when he's talking to Warren Buffett 40 years later, and Warren is saying, I'd like to buy your company for $170 million. That's not funny. That's pretty serious. That's pretty good. And that's the kind of thing that every entrepreneur would love to have as the ending of the story. That's all I knew when I started. I knew the beginning and the end. I had no idea what happens in the middle. That's a 40-year gap. But I knew enough right there that it's got to be good. You can't get from that cornfield in Syracuse with a cinder block building to Berkshire Hathaway and $170 million without some really great things happening. And so it was my privilege to write the book uh, for Bill. 
and to, to get to know just a really fine man, never mind a really good businessman. So I'll turn it over to Bill. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Jeff, and, and thank you, uh, students and entrepreneurs for future uh, successful businessmen for coming. It's a, a real pleasure to be here. UBC is, uh, I've watched it grow, and it's just been miraculous the way it's grown. 28,000 students. Your basketball program is great. Your other athletic programs have been very good, so I compliment you. That is uh, that is terrific. You are a very live and green, uh, growing concern. And uh, I, I can, oh, I might just say, uh, Jeff's an excellent writer. He just did a, an outstanding job. I was fortunate to get a hold of Jeff and to have him uh, be willing to write the, uh, the story. Uh, it, it, we, he couldn't change it, of course, you know, and the one thing I did was make sure that everything was uh, accurate and valid, uh, that it was totally accurate, uh, and, uh, which he did and he wanted also. So it turned out to be a book that, uh, and that's what I thought maybe I would talk about today, uh, it kind of exceeded our expectations. We didn't, uh, I didn't think it would do anywhere near as well. I wanted to write it basically for the... Uh, well, when I left the company and turned it over to my nephews, uh, we were doing 800 million. We sold it to Warren at 250 million. We were doing 800 million. We had 3,000 employees, or associates, we called them. And I felt like I would like them to know the culture, the customs, the traditions, uh, the values of the company. And I thought, the best way to do it is to put it in writing. And then I thought, you know, we've had thousands of customers over the years. Uh, every now and again, I'll get someone will come in and said, oh, my grandfather uh, bought all his furniture from you and all his uh, appliances from you and my father did and we have and so forth. So we go back three and four generations and I thought, you know, those people might have an interest in doing it. But uh, I've been very surprised because we've had people in Hong Kong. We've had uh, the ambassador from the Philippines read the book. Uh, and it was a very nice comment. I've had over 150 unsolicited uh, comments about the book and how much they enjoyed it. I haven't found anyone, of course, I'm sure I wouldn't, but that said, I didn't like the book. I had one guy down in Las Vegas that said, hey, I love the book. I wasn't impressed with your speech. I went down and talked to about 400 people, but he really liked, he liked the book. And I said, well, that's the most important thing. And uh, so it's really been uh, just a fascinating uh, experience to, to have. Uh, it's hard to put 50 years of experiences into 164 pages. That's the challenge. And how much you had to leave out. This is actually the third printing of the book and I was just going through it to see that they put all the things. We did talk them into making a few co uh, different changes. Not anything significantly, but there was a couple of people that were very significant that I originally wanted to put in the book and we didn't get them in there. But Jeff worked them in in the, in the third printing. So this is the newest printing. It has a comment from Dick Marriott, Marriott Corporation, on the top. It said, a great read, I couldn't put it down. And uh, he sent me the nicest letter. He said, you know, I can remember my dad telling me all these things. He was telling Bill and I, this is what you've got to do. Values, uh, uh, integrity, honesty, treating your customers right, uh, taking care of the little things. He said, it, it just reminded me of a book that uh, my dad should have written. And there was a book written out on Marriott. Let me just ask you a couple of questions, though. How many of you, well, how many of you know all about Warren Buffett? Just can you raise your hands that you've heard of Warren, Warren Buffett? Is there anybody that hasn't, that doesn't know anything about Warren Buffett? Warren, uh, real quickly, probably the greatest investor uh, of our times. He's the second richest man in the world. He lost $10 billion last year, and Bill Gates only lost $7 billion. So, uh, you know, but he's still the second richest man in the world. And he's a wonderful guy. He's just been a real mentor to me. I've learned so much from him after working with him for 15 years. But uh, he, did, he, did, he likes to talk to students. He, doesn't, he won't talk to trade associations. And I get asked every day, I was up at 
we were yesterday and one of the people come up and says, we got a conference coming up and we want to have you and Warren speak at that conference. I said, well, you could have me, but you can't have Warren. He, he just doesn't have the time to do it and he won't talk to anybody but students. And we've had some wonderful experience taking him back. I, I can originally, or I originally had him speak at Weber State uh, College at that time and he spoke to an overflowing uh, crowd and I had, happened to have the book that was written here in fact, I gave it to the dean yesterday, and it's uh, Warren Buffett Lecture, 1996. But it's amazing how much of the same philosophy he has is still profound today. He really hasn't changed a lot. I mean, he still answers a lot of the same questions. One of the students asked him, Warren, I want to be successful. I want to be rich. I want to, to really make my mark in this world. What can I do? What can I do now? And Warren said, well, the most important thing you can do right now is invest in yourself. In other words, get this education. So I compliment each and every one of you students for getting your education, investing in yourself. It's the smartest thing and the wisest thing you can do at this particular time. You'll have plenty of opportunities as life progresses. There's always opportunities. Uh, R.C. Willie had a great opportunity. He was a lineman with the power and light, and they were just electrifying the uh, communities of uh, Sunset, Clearfield, Syracuse, and he decided, well, look, maybe we can put, give these people some refrigerators or sell them some refrigerators. And he had a perfect market. And that's when he started doing that, selling door-to-door -door appliances, mainly refrigerators in the summer, electric ranges. Uh, and he just, he made a, a, a wonderful living doing that. He did it for 18 years. Uh, after 18 years, the Korean War came along, people couldn't get appliances during the first uh, or during the Second World War. So they thought, well, maybe we better beef up a little bit. So he, his business increased. <clears throat> and at that time, he had to hire an employee to help him to take care of delivery and service and so forth. And, uh, uh, and he had to build a store or buy a store or rent a store because his competition said, you know, here we got this guy, R.C. Willie, out there in the country selling a product out of his garage and he's selling door to door but he doesn't have any overhead we can't compete with him so the distributor had no defense against that they said you're absolutely correct uh, so they went to him and they said Mr. Willie and his name was Rufus so he was always called RC uh, you've got to procure a store we can't sell you unless you have a, a storefront and so they got thinking about it and decided to build the store right next to his house. 600 square feet, that's 20 by 30, uh, four parking lots. The power was run from the house to the store, electric power. You got a better rate residential than you did commercial. And he was a cost, he was a cost uh, uh, effective guy. He had a nine party telephone line, meaning there's nine other people on that line. You picked it up and somebody was on the line, you had to put it back down. Or if the, inter the conversation was interesting, why you stayed on. <laughs> but anyway, that was a real different experience. And he had an extension from that nine party telephone line into his, his little office. The little office was about that wide. And that was basically it. He had no bathroom facilities. There was no uh, water running. There was a little floor furnace that worked pretty well. So he built that in uh, 1948, 1954 is when he handed me the keys, as Jeff mentioned. Uh, thought he had an ulcer, ended up being cancer to the pancreas. And there I was, 22 years old, with the keys to the store. And the company was doing about a quarter million dollars in volume. Uh, and I thought every business had money. Uh, I learned later that uh, that wasn't true. We didn't have any money, we didn't have any liquidity. Uh, when we really boiled it down and I tried to get a loan to pay some of the overdue bills that we had, I found out that the only asset we had was a pickup truck. We had, a, had just built a six or a 2,000 square foot warehouse, owed $9,000 on it, never made a payment. Uh, we had a lot of contracts that were full recourse because he had never checked anyone's credit and they were with, with the local bank and he'd been dealing with a local banker who was an older guy and, and a wonderful old time banker with the garters here and he sat at a big stool there at the window and his name was Dick Gailey, Barnes Banking Company out in Kaysville, Utah, but a wonderful person. And the problem when R.C. passed away was that Dick Gailey used to take some widows, nothing hanky-panky, to Europe. And when you went to Europe, you went on a boat and so it was about a, a, a 
two months process. He'd take him there for four or five weeks, six weeks, and, uh, and there was the contact, R.C. Willie and Dick Gailey. And so after R.C. passed uh, away and I had the keys, here comes a fellow by the name of Alan Blood, who was the president-to-be and a little more astute banker, and said, you know, I look at this R.C. Willie, their account is in the red, uh, and I'd looked at that too uh, when I finally uh, got some checks and was able to write some checks uh, out. Uh, I looked in there and I thought, well, he must have an arrangement with the bank. I don't understand banking relationships, but I, I knew that you didn't write checks if you didn't have money in it personally, but I thought, well, the business is it's covered some way. There's got to be assets somewhere, and some way, but there really wasn't. And the banker called me and he said, you can't write these checks. You don't have any money in the bank. I said, well, I looked at the last two bank statements and they were all in the red. He said, I know, but that was a deal between Mr. Gailey and Mr. Willie. And you're not Mr. Willie, and so our deal is with you and you don't write checks unless you have money in that bank. So that was pretty firm. And we went through that situation. It was interesting. And this is part of the starting. And it's all in the book, uh, how we got started, how we survived. Uh, right shortly after that, I had a call from the IRS, and uh, that was a shock, too. Hadn't been paying any taxes. My father-in-law was an honest as a day as long, but he had a dishonest accountant who, uh, when we finally got, I got around to questioning him, he'd come and he said, oh, I'll come up and I'll, I'll bring you all the books. And he'd come up and dumped them on my mother-in-law's front porch, and we never could get a hold of him again. So there we were. So anyway, it was a very interesting start. But uh, I think like... Uh, uh, Jeff said it was a happy ending. It's a fulfillment of the American dream. To be able to sell it to Warren Buffett, to be able to have the experiences we've had, to be able to build a business from uh, one employee, which I had, that was only the one employee that I had, 600 square feet building up to uh, 14 stores now uh, in California, Nevada, uh, Idaho, Utah, and uh, to be doing, when I left, uh, a little over 800 million in sales. So there were a lot of opportunities and a lot of experiences on the way that were really fun. Uh, let me uh, quickly, uh, it was kind of interesting. Jeff brought his two sons with him and one of them said, Dad, I could give your talk. And he said, you could probably give Bill's talk. Because we were up at Utah State yesterday and uh, then we were at Weber State later on in the evening and uh, gave the same talks. So I have to tell you a story that Warren Buffett told. He said one time in Germany there was, a, or Europe, there was a very renowned physicist that had made some major, major discoveries and he was traveling with a chauffeur in his uh, automobile around Western uh, Europe. And he finally got to one of the uh, college towns in uh, Germany and the chauffeur when he got up, the chauffeur said, or he said, uh, the physicist said, you know, I'm so tired of giving this talk. He said, it's, uh, it, I, I don't know that I can even give one more talk. And this, the, uh, phys, uh, the chauffeur said, you know, I could give your talk. I've heard it so many times, and I'm tired of it too. And so the physicist said, well, I'll tell you what, we're about the same size. Uh, they, they don't know. They don't have a picture of me. Why don't we just change positions? I'll be the chauffeur you be the presenter. And so uh, at that point in time, the physicist was, was wanting to do about everything. And so the chauffeur did, a, as the presenter, did a fabulous job. He really covered his thing perfectly well and everything. And when he got through, there was a question, a uh, hand up in the back. And it was a, quite a renowned scientist. And he said, he, he asked a very complex question. And the chauffeur said, or presenter said, you know, uh, from a very uh, intelligent uh, college town like this, I would have expected a little more complex uh, and in-depth question than that. That question is so simple, I'm going to ask my chauffeur to go ahead and answer it. <laughs> so, you might see one of these boys up here. Uh, let me just, I, I do want to mention one thing that we would like to have, love to have you do, and that is questions. We'd like to answer any questions you might have, because then we find out what's on your mind. Uh, in the meantime, I think we've got... Uh, 20 minutes. 20 minutes? Okay, I'll take another five, and then we'll get into the... Uh, let me just mention a couple of things. 
This really was a climax in my business career to be a good friend of Warren Buffett's, to learn from him, and to uh, uh, just be able to uh, associate with him. It's been a, just been a fabulous experience. Uh, I can just mention and one, a couple of things really quickly about uh, opportunities are there. Uh, just before, about the time he gave this, right after he gave this lecture, at uh, our talk at uh, Weber State, uh, the high techs were flying, as you all perhaps remember. Uh, anything in a high tech was going great. A guy can set up an office, have a calculator, uh, get a public offering, and, uh, and uh, his capitalization would be unbelievable. I mean, the money was rolling in, people were buying it, stocks that start out at three or four dollars a share, get up to 130, 40 dollars a share, and there was nothing there. There was no assets, it was just a uh, concept and a uh, high-tech situation and program which uh, I've never l really learned to quite understand but anyway there was no value there and and but everybody the stocks were flying and everybody was saying my gosh I could have bought this stock for ten dollars and now it's up to forty dollars or I could have bought this stock and so everybody got excited about it I had a good friend that uh, was uh, president of uh, key bank or CEO of key bank at the time and uh, I took him to Warren's, Warren's uh, lecture and, uh, in Boise, well, it was the one in Boise, Idaho. And uh, Warren talked about value. He said, value is important. He said, earnings are important. Assets are important. He said, I don't know. I have no idea how to value these companies. But it says it doesn't make sense when a company that has just been in business for a year has no earnings has a, a market cap more than, say, Southern Pacific Railroad that has thousands, hundreds of thousands of lines of track and cars and, and uh, rail cars and uh, earnings. He said, it just doesn't make sense to me. Well, sooner or later, it didn't make sense to anybody else, and the high techs crashed, which was uh, uh, just a, a tragic, tragedy for a lot of people because they lost an awful lot of money. But uh, my friend didn't. He, uh, he was going to buy some high techs. He had committed, uh, not committed, but it had a list of t uh, high tech stocks he was going to buy. And, and so when he listened to Warren, he went back and said, I, no, I don't want to buy any of those stocks. He called me later and said, you know, Warren's lecture, that lecture saved me over a half million dollars. He said, had I bought those stocks, I'd have been a half million dollars down in my portfolio, he said. So I just have to tell you. Now, again, some people have thought Warren's lost it here because just recently he put $5 billion in Goldman Sachs. I mean, he got a 10% coupon or 10% uh, uh, return on his money uh, in addition to the uh, being able to take the upside on the stock. Stock was about 80,000 a share, or 8,000, 80,000 a share. It dropped down to about 50, and everybody said, you know, Warren has really lost it again. I mean, he's just, he's really lost it. Well, today it's up to, I don't know, 130 or 40. He's picked up a cool $2 billion on the increase in that stock with his $5 billion investment. And he's done the same thing with General Electric. He's getting 10%. He's a little underwater on General Electric, but eventually it'll come out. So here's really a brilliant guy. And in down times, there's still plenty of opportunities. Warren says, you know, I can tell value and I can pick great companies. I can't pick timing. Timing is the one thing that I can't, can't, uh, can't quite pick. I don't, I don't know how quick or when it's going to happen. Uh, I've had a lot of people, oh, by the way, the book, I've had a lot of people that have asked me many questions about the book. And uh, it's been kind of interesting and kind of fun to be able to, to talk to them about it and, uh, and, and go over certain things that are in the book. Uh, we talk about, uh, to start with, we talk about the beginning of the R.C. Willie Company and, and all its struggles through the various years, uh, the uh, building, all our buildings without debt. When I first started, I had no, uh, no way to get a loan. No one would loan us any money and, and any kind of a loan. I really, finally, when I realized our total asset was a pickup truck, we had an inventory that was all overcommitted. It was not paid for, floored. We had a little store, 600 square feet. We had a warehouse, uh, 2,000 square feet. They were all on the property of the house. 
the home property. They weren't on the, there was no, the only business property was uh, the pickup truck. That was the only thing that was registered. So it was a little bit of a challenge and uh, it was interesting dealing with the bank and dealing with the IRS and it was interesting uh, building the business. But after that first year, I never had a month that we were not profitable. And uh, we were fortunate to hire great people, good people that were committed to the company. It's kind of interesting how you learned how to delegate. I've got a lot of stories in there. One of them was a company that, or a fellow that wanted uh, to uh, imitate our company. He wanted to sell out of his garage, and he did. He started a terrific business. He was, he was underselling everybody else and did a fabulous job. And uh, in fact, his business grew so much that the city came along to him and said, you know, Bill, you can't really do business in this area. Your neighbors are all complaining. The traffic is terrible. The cars are, are piling. They're parked in everybody's uh, street and along the way. And, uh, you know, you've got, to, uh, you've got to get you a store or something. So he built a store, 25,000 square feet. And uh, it was rather interesting because he had done everything. Everybody talked to Bill. Everybody, you know, wanted to buy anything. It was Bill because he gave them the deals. Well, anyway, make a long story short, uh, when he got the store built, he hired a number of employees, and uh, if there was a problem on the roof, Bill was up there. If there was a delivery that came in, they, Bill had to go sign and check it off. If there was a customer that came in, Bill, they had to see Bill. And he just couldn't delegate, and he didn't have, an, he couldn't produce enough income himself to cover the overhead. So you have to delegate and you have to give authority to people. You have to be very careful that you get the right people and that they are accountable. But you have to turn them loose. It was rather interesting, uh, that situation, because here was really our number one competitor that his success actually uh, destroyed him. Uh, I could uh, mention a number of, a number of things and uh, I could just take a second, and I, I want to encourage you to read the book if you if you have it or if you do buy it. Let me just give you a couple of uh, uh, endorsements that I've had on the book that are kind of interesting. I had a, uh, a friend of ours that uh, Warren bought, and he said, "Dear Bill, I am generally a very slow reader, but I couldn't put down your wonderful book. Thanks for sending me a copy, which I will treasure." And I thought that was a great one. Here's another one that a fellow that uh, helped us uh, on doing some consulting in California that had been uh, a very high paid executive uh, through his history, through his uh, business career. He said, Dear Bill, it was an absolute delight to receive your book and more importantly to read it and your personal note. I am pleased to tell you that I have read it twice and marked it up. It's amazing how many judgment decisions you had to make to grow and sustain the business where many other and conventional wisdom pointed the opposite way. Uh, conventional wisdom. When the interest rates were 21%, we were loaning it out at 18%, which meant, and we were actually paying one over prime, uh, one time two over prime, and one over prime. Uh, and prime, of course, was 21%, meant we were paying 22%, we're loaning out at 18, we're losing 4% on every sale we made per year. If the guy wanted two years, it was an 8% loss. And uh, it was amazing. Uh, a lot of my people said, that doesn't make a lot of sense. How can you do that? And I think if I'd have had a uh, uh, Harvard MBA come along, he'd say, no, I don't think we should do that. But here was the pluses and minuses. The plus was nobody else, no other furniture or appliance company could finance anything. They had no source of financing. The banks wouldn't do it. The financial companies wouldn't do it. They, they could put their money out a lot better than they could, you know, to a, a retailer that was going to loan it out at 18%. And no one, no retailer would do that. And, uh, but it was two of the best years in our company's history. We grew immensely. We had no competition. Uh, our volume and the cost efficiency of in, the increased volume uh, made our company very, very profitable those two years, and we gained a tremendous amount of market share. And so that's a very, rather unconventional thing that you would do. There's another point that we make in the book on how you expand without borrowing money, a lot of money. Never borrowed, well, we borrowed money to our accounts receivable. And uh, 
I finally got into the finance business, and that's one of the reasons Warren bought us, because at the time that Warren bought us, we had almost $200 million on the books, and that was more profitable than the furniture business was. And, uh, but that's one of the sidelights that, that I got into uh, when I had so much trouble trying to place our paper and trying to finance. And you can't be in retail, the home furnishings or appliance business without having offering finances. You can't do it. I also talk a lot about debt. I talk a lot about uh, uh, overextension uh, in the book. I have uh, 13 principles. One of my competitors, uh, someone told me that he's got my 13 principles. He, uh, not a competitor, but a, a, a big dealer in Denver. He has 13 principles on his wall, blown up. He said, I was amazed. He said, after I read the book, I looked at that and I said, those are Bill Child's 13 principles that are in the book. And he says, uh, yeah, they are. And I can't agree with any one of them. They're all, I can't disagree with any one of them. They're all, all great. We had a, a, a tweet. I don't know what a tweet is, personally. My secretary came in. She says, you got a tweet from a company that has about 4,000 retail furniture stores. And they said, in there, this was the chief financial officer or chief operating officer, said, uh, you've got to read this book. It's amazing. It's, it's a great book, and I, we, we encourage all of you to pick it up and read it. It's How to Build a Business Warren Buffett Would Buy. So I thought that was rather interesting to have something like that. So anyway, uh, I want to get down to some, uh, some question and answers. I'm sure you're going to have some good ones. Oh, I had another fellow call me, and he said, you know, I was on my way to Korea to get my daughter, who was uh, being released from a mission. I was walking down the aisle, and I saw a Korean reading your book. He said, I was shocked. He said, I was amazed. I can't believe that. Uh, I've got some others. The ambassador of the Philippines, uh, oh, we talk about playing golf with Bill Gates and, and Warren Buffett on, uh, at Augusta. And uh, I'd say that's in the book also. And this one, and it, it's, uh, the story is rather, rather interesting. Oops, time flies, doesn't it? Uh, interesting because uh, we were rounding the nine. We played for two days. We were rounding the, uh, going to the tenth hole. And I stepped in the restroom and uh, I could hear some guy in there saying, you know, he said, we've got a, a, quite a foursome out here today. We got Warren Buffett, we got Bill Gates, we got Tom Murphy, and then there's some other guy. And I was the other guy. So <laughs> the uh, ambassador said, the two things that are rare to happen in one's life, friendship with a business icon, Warren Buffett, and your chance to play as the other guy at Augusta National. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of interesting. I, I have another, here's one more that's kind of cute. Your book is fantastic. It tells as well as can be told how true grit, integrity, and doing what is right in all aspects of life really pay off. In fact, your book should be required reading in every school of business in the United States. Your book is so good, I am giving copies to all my 12 children. Uh, he, I think he's been, he has, uh, his wife died about four or five years ago and he's remarried and so that's how he's come up with the 12 children. With a father's mandate to read and learn. And of course there's another story in there, how I convinced Warren Buffett to get out of state. We're closed on Sunday. And Warren, I wanted to take him to Las Vegas and uh, well I, I kind of, felt like we needed to move to Las Vegas, and I thought our model was good enough, and I had our, our uh, management was strong enough, we had people that could handle it there, and so we were really ready to move. And Las Vegas, especially Henderson, Las Vegas, uh, or Henderson, Nevada, fastest growing state, or fastest growing city in America uh, for about 10 years, and that's where we wanted to go. And so I took Warren down, flew him over the property in a helicopter, and I showed him all the rooftops. And when he got through, he said, we're not going. And I said, it's got to be the Sunday closing. He, yep. he said, we're not going to open on Sunday, but we're not going to go into a market we can't be successful at. And we can't be successful in Las Vegas and be closed on Sunday. Well, finally come up with uh, Boise, Idaho, because I knew when Warren makes up his mind, you don't change it. And he gave me the same static, the same static, and about three times, and I finally made him an offer he couldn't turn down, and that's in the book. We went into Boise, Idaho, and we were very successful. We went into Las Vegas. That was one of the conditions. If we're successful in Boise, you'll let me go to Las Vegas. And he said, he just, you know, well, what can I do? And so we were very successful in Las Vegas and closed on Sunday. Sacramento, the same. Reno, the same. Uh, 
Dean, I think. Five or six minutes. We got five or six minutes left? Oh, we better go some QA. Q okay. Jeff, come on up. Why don't we just answer some questions? I'll get out of that spot by a little bit. But, uh, Dean, maybe you could pick out the questions sure. and move it in. Yeah. 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 Uh, Bill, when you first started out, started out after you took the keys from your, from your father, what are some things that stood out that made your business different than anybody else's? You know, the asset we had, the number one asset, and the I always look at competitive advantages. When we went out of state, uh, I, I knew we had to have a competitive advantage. We just couldn't be another furniture store just like everybody else. But we had an advantage. and We didn't have capital. We didn't have cash. We had a great reputation for saving people money. Uh, R.C. Willie had sold for 22 years and he had sold uh, merchandise for less than they could buy it in, uptown in any f store in town. So those customers were loyal because he saved them money. And that was my asset. That's what I finally explained to the banker. I said, you can close this down. You're going to get nothing. Let, us, let me s stay and continue to run the business, and we'll pay you off. And we did. But our asset was loyal customer base. That was it, number one, and probably number two and number three. Other questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, actually, the same question uh, as, as he had, when, when you were stuck, you know, I don't want to say stuck, but when you were stuck holding the keys, so to speak, uh, to the business and everything, much of also what Jeff was talking about was just sort of a life transition that you were going through at the time. So instead of just the business, what were you going through personally when you were holding those keys? Well, I had a, a contract to teach school, and uh, I wasn't sure I would ever be a lifetime teacher, but at least uh, it was better than farming. And in Syracuse at that time, uh, there it seemed like you had uh, maybe a 5% opportunity of being a teacher and a 95% opportunity of being a farmer. And farming was so tough, you couldn't control so many of the elements, you couldn't control the price of the product. Uh, uh, it was just an awful hard business to be into. And I didn't want any part of that. I grew up on it and I saw my dad struggle and, and make a little money and lose a lot of money. And it, it just was something that, and so I thought, well, teaching, you know, we never had a lawyer come out of uh, Syracuse for you know, all those years, we never had a doctor or uh, an engineer. And, and of course, there was no such thing as high tech. I know the first uh, radio that my grandparents bought and when my fa grandfather or grandmother died, we inherited it. It was a little wooden box and it had a, a little button that uh, said television. And I never could figure out how that was going to work because there was nothing else except that little box and that little radio that uh, worked pretty well. But television, you know, it's amazing. Uh, and I talk about change in this uh, book, too, quite a bit, and adapting to change. I can remember the first time that I had a fellow come in and try to sell me a fax machine. Anybody ever remember what a fax machine is? You know? <laughs> but anyway, he came in and he, uh, he gave me such a sales pitch, I was ready to buy it. I said, you know, that's fabulous. I can send that letter and he can get it. 20, 30 minutes later, that company, I can fax all this stuff and, and I don't have to put it in the mail and wait for uh, a week or 10 days for it to get there. He says, absolutely. And I, I was so excited and all at once I said, you know, there's got to be somebody on the other end that has a fax too. I said, how many of these have you sold? And he said, it was a local company, and he said, you know, it's great, and we'll sell a lot. We're going to sell a ton of them. I said, what, how many have you sold? Said, You're my first customer. <laughs> so I said, look, you better come back and see me in a year from now. And he did, of course, and you know, the fax was great. But today, the fax is obsolete. And sooner or later, your computer will be your cell phone. It's just amazing what's moving. Other questions? Yes. How was the sale of uh, RC Willie initiated? Well, there again, it's in the book. <laughs> I don't know, I've got time to explain it. Uh, in 1994, companies were acquiring companies, and, and they were always looking for good companies. And our company had grown at the rate of 17% a year for over 40 years. 
and uh, our profits were solid, sound. We're doing around 250 million in sales. Uh, we were a prime target. We had two companies that uh, were furniture companies. One was a company called Heilig Myers, and the other was a company called Montgomery Wards. And they offered me a lot of money. They offered me 200 million plus. But both of them I turned down because I didn't like the companies quite. I didn't like the management and so forth. We didn't have to sell. We had no reason to sell except for the estate tax. If anything had happened to me or my wife, we'd have had to come up with close to $100 million to pay Uncle Sam. That would have killed the business. It would have been gone. And then there was three other uh, uh, investment bankers that wanted to. And, and I, I could go through reasons why, but we turned all those down. So the only choice, really, in my opinion, was Warren Buffett. So I happened to ask a friend of mine whose store he had bought. He bought the Nebraska furniture market and paid him $60 million for it. And Mrs. B, who was a Jewish immigrant uh, from Russia, uh, owned the store, came over, couldn't speak a word of English, had, a, had her name on her, her tag around her neck, built this great furniture company, and he paid him $60 million. But she didn't want stock. She wanted cash. She, a piece of paper that said, you have so many shares of Berkshire Hathaway, didn't mean anything to her. You know, she could spend the cash. And she could never, they could never convince her to take any stock. Had she have taken stock when the stock a year ago was worth about $4 billion, $60 million worth a little over $4 billion. Today it's worth probably three and a half, $3 billion. And, uh, but they didn't. They took cash. So one of the things that I did was I took all stock. But anyway, that was the introduction. And War, uh, Irv said, I'm going to have a meeting with uh, Warren. We're going to go to lunch or dinner. I'll ask him. And so he calls me and he said, you know, Warren is very interested in buying your company or looking at it if you're willing to sell. I said, well, I'd like to talk to him. And he said, he's going to call you in about two minutes. So I hung up. And sure enough, there was a call from Warren Buffett. And it was just very pleasant from there on. Uh, he made me a fair offer. It was short of what I'd been offered, but it was fair. I didn't negotiate. Warren doesn't negotiate. He said, you know, if I think it's worth 100 million, you think it's worth 150 million, we're not going to get together. But he didn't negotiate and we didn't negotiate. So we had a wonderful relationship there. Uh, and uh, he's very happy. I just told him I wanted a fair price. I wanted whoever bought the company to be just as happy 10 years downstream as they are the day that they bought it. And I think that was fulfilled. I stayed with the company and managed it for another seven years, which he insists on, and then turned it over to my nephews who are now running it. Thank you. I'd like to thank Mr. Child and Mr. Benedict for being with us today.